Good evening. My name is Karen, and I'm a community education coordinator for Boulder Community Health. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture, Relieving Arthritis, Hip, and Knee Pain. I'd like to go over the format for the lecture. The lecture portion will last about an hour. Afterwards, we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please type your short general question in the chat box below the video on your screen, and we will take as many as we can. On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Clint Brian Blackwood. Dr. Blackwood is Boulder and Longmont's first fellowship trained hip and knee replacement specialist. He has successfully treated over 5,000 patients with hip and knee problems and has performed over 3,000 robotic assisted surgeries. He was the first surgeon in Colorado to offer MAKO total knee replacement. He sees patients at Boulder Center for Orthopedics and Spine in Boulder. Welcome, Dr. Blackwood. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in, um, taking some time out of your, your evening to learn a little bit more about how to relieve arthritic hip and knee pain. Um, a little bit more about myself. Uh, I grew up in Montana, attended a small college there called Carroll College, uh, played football during my undergrad years. For medical school, I went to the University of Washington out in Seattle and then did a residency in orthopedic surgery at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Following that training, I did a fellowship in joint replacement at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute in St. Helena, California with Dr. Tom Kuhn and Adam Friedhand. Uh, and I was the first surgeon with fellowship level training specifically in robotic assisted joint replacement. I have medical licenses in Colorado and Montana, uh, and I am a consultant for Striker Robotics, uh, meaning I do a little bit of development on the uh, software uh, and education uh, for surgeons around the country um, and around the world. Uh, we were lucky enough to have surgeons uh, visiting us from Great Britain uh, as part of the British uh, Orthopedic Research Society traveling fellowship uh, visited us last week uh, in the OR. So it was a good way to spread what we do uh, here in Boulder, uh, Colorado throughout the world. I have deep roots here uh, in Colorado in spite of growing up in Montana. Uh, that is actually me, the young gentleman there in the hat and the glasses. Uh, my grandparents lived up in Longmont uh, while I was growing up and I'd come down in the summers, work on the farm um, and the, won a blue ribbon at the Boulder County Fair um, around 1990 uh, and then is actually on the front page of the Times call uh, there picking up hay, uh, dragging around on the, on the trailer. So. We spent a lot of time in Colorado uh, in spite of growing up in Montana and uh, we'll now be making it uh, 10 years uh, this week that I've been in practice here uh, in Boulder, Colorado and it's been a great experience for me. Uh, the family has expanded while we've been here, uh, so we have the five children. Uh, my daughter was bored and decided to join me as one of the three other people in the room that we're giving the lecture to tonight uh, and a thousand of you have signed up uh, online to watch this. So. Um, this is what we're doing, uh, keeping us busy, and everybody likes to see uh, the pictures of the kids and children. Uh, this is us enjoying some time and free time. A little bit of this is to sort of personalize and humanize all the physicians and surgeons uh, that you may interact with. We are just normal, everyday people, um, and we're trying our best to help you uh, overcome uh, problems as you may have uh, in your daily life. So. Um, Moving on to my practice here, uh, as part of the Boulder Center for Orthopedics, I mainly do hip and knee replacements. Uh, people make fun of me because I say I only do three things, uh, and I may only do three things, but I try to do them as well as I can. Uh, in general, we focus on minimally invasive surgical techniques uh, and combine that with advanced technology. We're able to do 99 plus percent of our cases done under a spinal anesthetic, so you can avoid a general anesthesia and avoid having a, a tube down your throat. Average length of stay for total hip replacement and total knee replacement is approximately one day. Um, and we're having more and more people that are being discharged home the same day. So um, we're doing this at the outpatient surgery center, uh, at the Boulder Surgery Center, as well as outpatient from Boulder Community Health, uh, where we have uh, 50 to 75% of the patients each day that are able to go home the same day, uh, and the rest are able to be discharged after one night in the hospital. So um, we're really helping patients get up, get moving, uh, and get a good outcome with this, these surgeries. 
Boulder Center for Orthopedics. We are now moving on seven years since our, our merger um, with Boulder Orthopedics and Mapleton Hill Orthopedics. Um, we have created a center of excellence in Boulder County, um, and we have the lowest complication rate for surgeries in Boulder uh, at Boulder Community Health. So uh, from all specialties, uh, foot and ankle, hand, sports, and joint replacement, uh, we try to provide you with uh, excellent care across a broad spectrum of uh, your orthopedic uh, needs. Want to kind of start a little bit with the basics of why we're here tonight um, and talk a bit about what is arthritis? Um, what do we call that? Um, there are two main types of arthritis. And as you can see here on the left, we have a normal knee. That shiny white stuff is cartilage. It is a very low friction, uh, pain-free substance that allows for very smooth gliding motion. It's excellent for joints. As that cartilage breaks down for a variety of reasons, it exposes the bone underneath and there's a lot of pain fibers in bone and as that bone gets exposed, it causes a lot of pain and discomfort uh, throughout the joint. Um, it can cause pain and swelling and decreased mobility. The main type of this arthritis is called osteoarthritis and this is where you basically just describing the worn out articular cartilage. So when that cartilage wears away and exposes the bone underneath, um, that is by definition osteoarthritis. There are other types of arthritis that are called inflammatory arthritis. And these are more of a systemic process where the body turns and attacks itself. So this is most commonly known as rheumatoid arthritis. There's also examples of psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, many other sort of uh, instances where the body turns against and starts to attack its normal tissues. Uh, inflammatory arthritis can be very well treated uh, with medications by a rheumatologist, um, but in some instances those fail and those inflammatory arthritis needs to be treated the same way we treat osteoarthritis. This is what it looks like on x-ray. So the knee on the right hand side of the screen you can see has good space between the bones. Uh, that space is the cartilage. So cartilage does not show up on x-ray, uh, but we can assess that it's there by the fact that bones are not touching. On the left hand side of the screen you can see that this is where we get that term bone on bone arthritis. The cartilage has been fully worn away and exposing the bone underneath, uh, leaving those bones to rub against each other. And that causes a lot of pain, inflammation, uh, and significant disability. It doesn't have to be quite as dramatic as that. It can be isolated to single compartments of the knee. So as you can see here on the inside part of the knee, there's no cartilage and there's bone on bone there as opposed to the outside parts of the knee on the edges of the screen. Works similarly in hips. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. Uh, it's a very smooth gliding motion. And when that hip starts to wear out and expose the bone underneath, it can cause some pain and discomfort. What often happens with hips is it becomes stiff before it becomes painful. So you may notice some more difficulty putting on shoes and socks, trimming your toenails, uh, just a decreased range of motion of the hip uh, that precedes pain. Uh, and when a hip wears out, it can wear out very quickly. Uh, the most common thing I hear is it's bothered me for about a year or two. This is a pretty significant, uh, severe example of that. So again, a normal hip on the right-hand side, good space between the ball and the cup. On the left-hand side, no space between the ball and the cup. The ball has been deformed and looks more sort of like a melting mushroom. Uh, and there's big bone spurs that you can see sort of there at the, the bottom of that joint. So uh, that's a very severely arthritic hip uh, in need of uh, some significant attention and, and treatment. There are other causes for hip pain, which can be a little confusing. The hip is sort of a very generic area from sort of the low back down to the mid thigh. Uh, we can get pain on the outside or side of the hip. The, it's worse when you lay on that side and it can come on rather acutely. Uh, that can usually be bursitis, uh, which is more of an inflammation of a bursa sac. Um, that's usually best treated with stretching, some anti-inflammatories and maybe injection. Back pain can radiate and cause pain that goes down to the groin and the hip. And this is so we uh, differentiate between that with x-rays. So we'll get x-rays of your pelvis and x-rays of your back uh, to help differentiate which is the bigger cause of that pain. Uh, and there can also be soft tissue things that can mimic hip pain or groin pain. Uh, people can have hernias, uh, an opening in the abdominal area that causes pain in the groin as well. Uh, so many different things that can sort of be lumped in with hip pain as a cause. Mentioned there was a thousand people that logged on for this uh, talk today. Uh, there's a reason for that. The number of people with hip and knee arthritis is growing and the number of people who need hip and knee replacements is growing uh, quite significantly. So this study was put out uh, approximately 20 years ago. Uh, it shows a predicted increase in the number of uh, hip and knee replacements uh, until the year 2030. So we're starting to approach that and you can see we're starting to increase the number of these from 500,000 
knee replacements being done in 2005 to 3.5 million knee replacements projected to be done in 2030. Uh, and hip replacements is from 200,000 to 500,000. So pretty significant increase in the number of people who are wearing out their joints um, and will eventually need knee, knee or hip replacement. These patients are a different generation of patients. They're better educated patients, they're older patients, they're younger patients, and they have different expectations. Um, it used to be you could go to the doctor and he'd give you a cane or a walker and say kind of live with this you know, until you absolutely can't. Uh, but now people want to maintain their quality and active lifestyles. So patients want to get out and hike, they want to get out and enjoy the area that we live, uh, and they don't want to put up with being told there's restrictions or assistive devices that can help with them. Uh, they can be better informed. They're attending lectures like this. They're finding information from their friends and uh, from their doctors. Uh, there's a lot of information on the internet as well, uh, which allows widespread access to information, but there isn't any quality control on the internet. So beware of the internet and to some extent stem cells as well. Uh, there's a lot of promise and potential in some things, uh, but not a lot of performance in others. But the big question that we hear and what we actually want you to do, I know it's weird for me as a joint replacement surgeon to say I want you to not need a joint replacement, but our first line is to always help you prevent or delay having a joint replacement. And these are the things we can do for that. So here's some of the treatment options we have for some of this hip and knee pain. Uh, the first is to sort of rest and modify your activities. Uh, try little ice or heat applications. Um, some anti-inflammatory medications can be very helpful. Uh, it's surprising how many people I see that don't want to take ibuprofen, Aleve, Tylenol. Uh, and we don't want you to take that for a long period of time at a very high dose. But in low doses and used judiciously, it can be very helpful to relieve this arthritic pain. Lifestyle modifications are important, so avoiding high impact activities, so running and jumping is very hard on the joints. Um, and so if you can avoid that and do more joint healthy activities like biking, that can be helpful. Physical therapy uh, can be helpful in early stages of arthritis to help strengthen the joint and maintain motion. Um, but in late stages of disease, uh, unfortunately physical therapy can aggravate uh, the disease, but can be very helpful uh, after the, the surgery is completed. Joint fluid supplements and injections is sort of a big topic that we'll, we'll expand on here in a minute. Knee arthroscopy used to be done. There used to be the idea that you could go in and try to clean up the knee and try to buy a little time that way. Uh, that's definitely fallen out of favor. So unless you have an acute injury with a definite meniscus tear or a loose body, um, there's not much need to have a knee arthroscopy or a knee scope uh, just to kind of try to clean up some arthritis. Um, they found that that doesn't work very well uh, and actually can have some detrimental effects on future surgeries. And then total joint replacement we'll talk about uh, extensively here. These are the AOS uh, non-surgical recommendations for management of knee arthritis. One of the biggest ones is uh, weight loss. Um, we're very lucky here in Boulder County where um, obesity isn't quite the epidemic that it is in other parts of the country, um, but still you know, weight loss is important and it's something we discuss with many patients. Uh, the body weight actually is five to 10 times across your knee. Um, and so every pound that you lose can be five to seven pounds of body weight uh, off those knees and hips, which can be very helpful. And we've had some people who've lost weight who then have not needed to have their joints replaced for a period of time. Uh, exercise and physical therapy, keeping the motion in the knees can be helpful. And then these oral medications that we talked about, uh, the Tylenol, um, the anti-inflammatories uh, and others, uh, including some injections. So uh, I'm gonna expand on these a little bit. Um, this ibuprofen, Aleve, Tylenol, and some prescription medications like Celebrex, Meloxicam, or, or Diclofenac uh, can be very helpful to sort of help to alleviate pain. Um, we sometimes have patients who show up the morning of surgery uh, having taken their Celebrex the night before and tell us that, oh, I don't, I don't need to have surgery now, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, but so there is some benefit to these medications, uh, although the dose that we give them Celebrex prior to surgery can be a little bit deceiving. There's topical compounds. If there are patients that aren't able to take these medications orally, if they have blood thinners that they take or if they have kidney disease. Um, and so there's some topical compounds. Voltaren gel is now over the counter. Um, that can be very helpful uh, in some patients who can't take these oral medications. Glucosamine and chondroitin is a very popular supplement um, and people will try to take that. There hasn't been any big studies supporting it on a population-based uh, metric, uh, but there are individuals who tend to get relief from this. Uh, so if you're taking it and you're wondering if it's working, I'd recommend stopping and seeing if you notice a difference. Uh, if you don't notice a difference, then it's probably not helping. Uh, but if you notice a difference, then it may be helping you. Modified activities and weight loss. Uh, the reason we sort of 
pick weight loss as important is because there can be downsides that come with that from risk for surgery. So after we have you avoid some of these high impact activities like running and jumping, um, our goal is to get your, your weight under what we call a body mass index level of 40. So above 40, there can be risks associated with the surgery, including uh, bleeding, infection, uh, pneumonias, blood clots, um, a lot of complications with the surgery. Um, so if we can get you below that number, it makes it a little easier and safer for you to undergo surgery. Uh, we also understand that it can be difficult to lose weight as you uh, have poor joints, and that can definitely contribute to that. Um, and so we can work with you, and it's not a firm cap at 40, uh, but we we'll definitely have discussions about how to, how to get to that point and do this as safe as we can. Injections we'll talk about. Uh, there's multiple different types of these, so we'll go over those individually. Cortisone is the first line. It's an anti-inflammatory that gets injected into the joint. You want to use this judiciously, and so we try to spread these out. If you do them too soon or too often or too high a dose, there can be detrimental effects to the cartilage, ligaments, and soft tissues inside the joints. Um, and so we try to spread those out if we can. If they're used appropriately, uh, they have very minimal negative side effects, uh, but it's not zero. Um, and so we have that discussion with each individual patient. Visco supplementation or chicken shots, this is hyaluronic acid injections. It's covered by most insurances in the knees, but not for hips. It's actually starting to become less covered, unfortunately. I know Kaiser doesn't do these injections at all, and there's some other med uh, insurance plans that have stopped covering these injections as well. They seem to work better in less severe arthritis, um, but it is in bigger studies shown to be kind of a coin flip how much they help with uh, the knee pain. Uh, they're one injection a week for three weeks, and they can be helpful for people with either early arthritis or late arthritis who really want to try everything they can prior to discussing surgery or who aren't surgical candidates, unfortunately. PRP or platelet-rich plasma. This is sort of getting into the biologic sphere. Uh, the idea here is to draw blood from the patient um, and inject that blood back into the joint uh, after it's been concentrated uh, to really get those blood products and enhance healing around the joint. This does have a lot more efficacy in soft tissue, uh, in tennis elbow and hamstring tears, a little bit in rotator cuffs. It's not covered by insurance. It can be expensive in the five to $600 in injection range. Um, there's sort of mixed data uh, looking at this in joints. Um, some people have studies showing that it's similar to a cortisone injection or to a, a hyaluronic acid injection, um, but there isn't definitely not any regenerative effects. You're not going to cure the arthritis with a PRP or play the rich plasma injection. So um, just make sure you have a, a really honest conversation with your physician about the potential benefits of PRP in joints. We're sort of, you know, 10 miles away from the epicenter of stem cells uh, here in Boulder. Um, the idea and the promise of stem cells is that they obtain these stem cells and concentrate them and then inject them into the joint to help decrease some of the pain and inflammation, potentially promote healing. Uh, it's not covered by any insurances um, routinely uh, and is very expensive in the range of five, ten to twenty thousand dollars, depending on the, the mixture and um, protocol that you go through for this. Uh, the idea that stem cells are useful in medicine, yes, obviously stem cells are very useful in some treatments for cancers, um, even in now doing studies with multiple sclerosis, uh, but they have not really shown much benefit in joints on long-term benefit. Um, I have seen patients in their 70s, 80s, 90s who really wanted to try to avoid surgery and spent ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 getting uh, stem cells injected into their joints uh, when really there was little chance that that was gonna help. Um, the stem cell people seem to think that the future of orthopedics is to be shuffled off to the dustbin of history. Uh, so I think we should look a little bit further into stem cells and see what these uh, treatments look like. So I um, actually went to the Regenex website to can see what they bring uh, to support the treatments for hip and knee arthritis. So this is uh, comparing bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which is the stem cells against total knee replacement. So as you can see, the total knee replacement patients, this knee society score is out of 100. So 100 is as high as you can get, and then lower than that is more severe pain and discomfort. Uh, there was a 32-point increase uh, in improvement in a total knee replacement as compared to a 13-point improvement in the stem cells. So uh, both groups did get better, uh, but it would appear that the um, total uh, knee replacement group got substantially better. And there's definitive long-term evidence of how long these uh, joint replacements last, and there's no long-term studies on how long stem cells uh, offer improvement uh, if they do. 
hips was similar. Uh, I was actually more uh, in favor of the actual surgery for the hip replacement. So again, more severe uh, disease in the hips that were replaced as compared to those in the stem cell or bone marrow aspirate group. Uh, we had again an improvement of uh, 36 points, uh, sorry, 38 points in the uh, hip replacement group as opposed to 13 points again in the stem cell group. So um, the hip replacements were markedly improved uh, over stem cells. Um, and I think this should definitively say that the, the stem cells are of little value in, uh, in hip arthritis and pain. So uh, I sort of, we're all out here in the West. Uh, snake oil was a big thing here as you came out in the 1880s and, and early 1900s. Snake oil actually worked, but it had nothing to do with the snakes. So um, there was capsaicin powder in the snake oil and that did help um, actually with some of the pain and discomfort and inflammation. Uh, but I don't think that it had any, there was no reason to call it snake oil at that point. There may be some potential benefit and I think there should be research done into stem cells, uh, but I don't think that that is a uh, regenerative cure for arthritis. Um, and I, I have a feeling that this is actually headed toward uh, the dustbin of history instead of uh, orthopedic surgery. There are consequences in delaying surgery. Uh, we understand it's a, it's a difficult decision. Um, it can be very daunting listening to what we actually do for surgery and, and what the recovery looks like, and we understand that. Uh, but osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease. So um, they did a study at Duke uh, 10 years ago that showed 88% of patients declined to have a joint replacement. Um, my suspicion is now that number would be lower. Uh, but there are still people who will just not get their joint replaced or not get this fixed due to, to kind of fear or concern uh, of what they're looking at for recovery wise. There are better outcomes reported in patients who had a joint replacement earlier in the disease process. So they compared patients who had surgery earlier versus those who waited two years. And the patients who had surgery earlier had improved function and reduced pain. Uh, so we no longer are telling patients to wait as long as you can, to try to put it off as long as you can. You wanna do it at the appropriate time. You don't wanna just jump into surgery. You don't wanna have two or three months of pain and, and need to have it fixed and, and replaced. Uh, usually it's a, a many years long process and there are things we can do to help put surgery off, but you shouldn't just wait as long as you possibly can anymore. There's been a lot of improvements and new opportunities in arthroplasty. Our success rate is more than 90% at 20 years, and we're actually looking at positive success rates out to 30 years out from both hip and knee replacements. Uh, we can do partial and total knee replacements, and we have much improved minimally invasive procedures and techniques and new designs and technology uh, to help with the recovery and make it sort of a, a less uh, onerous process to go through. So part of what I am known for is uh, MAKO and, and robotic arm assisted surgery. So what is that and how does that impact joint replacement? Um, so it's computer navigated and robotic arm assisted uh, surgery uh, that helps us be more precise and accurate uh, and make better decisions in surgery and then execute those plans. Uh, the idea initially with this, uh, they started with Mako Robotic Arm Assisted Surgery in 2006, uh, was with partial knee replacements. And so the idea here was to take a procedure that's very technically demanding manually um, and see if we can make it uh, reproducible and consistent uh, with robotics. And so the idea is to find knees that have pain and damage isolated to just a single compartment of the knee that's usually medial or lateral, but sometimes can be under the kneecap and see if we can just replace the area that's worn out. So here we're just replacing the inside part of the knee, leaving the rest of the knee intact, leaving your ACL and PCL intact, and giving you a more normal feeling knee. It can be isolated just under the kneecap. So if you just have pain going up and down stairs or doing squats, but you can walk on flat ground okay, then this may be something that can be a, an option for you. Um, there is also sort of a a rare two-thirds of the knee uh, that can be replaced. So um, in younger patients where we're trying to conserve bone, um, we can replace two-thirds of the knee, uh, most commonly medial and, and patellofemoral, uh, to get in there and sort of place those components individually uh, to give a good outcome for the patients. The idea and how this works uh, is the patient must have the correct indications for the procedure. So your x-rays need to match up, your physical exam needs to match up. Um, if everything looks like you'd be a good candidate for a partial knee replacement, we then get a CT scan of the knee and then they make a 3D model of the knee on the, on the computer so that we know exactly that patient's individual knee um, and can see exactly where we wanna place these components. 
Uh, we can use that model to plan within a tenth of a degree or a tenth of a millimeter exactly where it needs to be on each individual patient. And once we have that plan, we bring the patients back to the operating room. Uh, we find the, the hip center. Uh, we put some pins in the thigh bone and chin bone to track the bones in space with optical trackers. Uh, once we open up the joint, we map out the joint to match up to the computer joint uh, so we can really match up to that CT scan. Uh, and then we can confirm that registration. So this helps to eliminate garbage in, garbage out issues with some of the older computer navigation systems. Uh, so we can really verify that this is that patient's uh, information and CT scan. Once that's combined, the patient's knee and CT scan are morphed together uh, on the computer, and we can take the patient's knee through a range of motion and really kind of fine tune the position of that component in space. So we can optimize implant tracking, we can map out the cartilage so there's a nice smooth transition from the native cartilage to the new implant. And the most important is we can balance the joint and the implants before we make any bone cuts. So we can adjust exactly in any frame uh, where we want to put that component to optimize the patient outcome. Uh, so I really think of it as sort of an infinitely personalized process where we can take off the shelf components and fit them exactly where they need to fit for you. There still are eight different sizes, so not everyone gets the same size of implant. We find the size that's closest fit for you and then fit it exactly where it needs to fit for, for each individual patient. It's done through a minimal incision to allow for less tissue damage. Surgery usually takes 20, 30 minutes. After we've finalized our operative plan, uh, we use a high-speed burr to make our cuts. Um, they're Computer creates a safety room that we can go into to keep us from cutting things that we don't want to cut. So we only cut the amount of bone that's needed to replace with the metal, um, but we don't cut any soft tissue that, uh, un that we're not intending to cut. And so we're sort of kept inside the lines uh, to make sure we get this bone removed and then we can cement in the components that we need uh, to replace that arthritic bone that's causing the problem. That's what it looks like on x-ray. So on the left pre-op where we have the, the inside part of the knee touching uh, and then after surgery where we've replaced that with metal and plastic uh, to get rid of that arthritic state. It's a less invasive, very accurate, reproducible bone conserving procedure. Um, you can see here we can do this medial uh, on the inside of the knee, lateral on the outside of the knee, uh, or just under the kneecap, uh, or a combination of the two. So a lot of different options that we can do for partial knee replacements. Um, we do uh, probably more partial knee replacements than other places in the state, um, and patients have very good outcomes with that. Studies that have been done showing a uh, comparison of robotic arm assisted surgery to uh, manual technique surgery um, they showed patients with a significantly higher excellent knee score um, at three months um, in the robotic arm assisted surgery, almost twice as many as compared to the manual surgery. Um, patients also had less pain uh, at postoperative day six of the, part of the robotic partial knee surgery than they did at postoperative week eight of the manual surgery. Um, so patients had a quicker recovery and better outcomes after that. Um, knee satisfaction scores have continued um, trending to 90 plus percent, uh, very satisfied or satisfied at two and five year follow-up. Uh, so patients are very happy and, and doing well with this. It also has a very low revision rate. So partial knees have a little bit of a bad name uh, because if you don't do them very well, they tend to wear out relatively quickly. And so in national registry data uh, from Australia and Sweden, it's about four to five percent failure rate at two years, uh, whereas with the robotic arm assisted, it was one percent uh, at two years. So we decreased that by 80 percent um, just by using robotics. They then graduated and brought this technology to total knee replacement. Um, and so we want to show you how that impacts total knee. A total knee replacement, we replace the ends of the, the thigh bone with metal uh, and shin bone with metal and have a plastic uh, liner in between. And then we put a little plastic button under the kneecap uh, in many cases as well. And the idea here, this is a normal knee, uh, so good healthy cartilage. As that cartilage wears away and exposes the bone underneath, causes pain and discomfort. And so the idea is to sort of recap and resurface the ends of the bone with metal and plastic to get rid of that uh, and allow patients to improve their mobility and, and have less pain and discomfort after the surgery. So it looks like on x-ray, normal knee on the left, an arthritic knee on the right. Um, so pretty severe bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, too bad for a partial knee. Uh, patient's too far gone and needs to have a, a total knee replacement done. And so this is what that looks like on, on x-ray. Uh, we resurface the ends of the bones with that metal and plastic. 
And then a little plastic button under the kneecap as well. Why would we want to use robotics in this? Um, there can be variability with manual instrumentation, so using multiple different sort of jigs and cutting devices, um, and they show pretty clearly that there's more accuracy and better uh, cuts with the robot as compared to manual instrumentation. It also kind of limits you with manual instrumentation as the angles and rotation that you can put onto the implants uh, because it's difficult to do that. And so now we can plan with the robotics. And our goal with that is that currently we have a gap in knee replacement. Overall, we have 99% survivorship at 10 years in multiple different studies. Uh, but overall, if you look at big, broad patient studies, it's 80 to 85% satisfaction uh, and patients are happy that they had their knee replaced. So this 18% gap that we're looking for, that's where we're really trying to make improvements um, and try to do as good as we can for every single patient so that we bring that patient satisfaction score up to 99% to match the survivorship. We want everybody not just to have a functional surviving knee, we want them to have a knee they're satisfied with. This is how we do that. Um, again, we get that CT scan, uh, goes from the hip to the knee to the ankle. They make that 3D model out of the CT scan and we size and position everything virtually. Place these array trackers in the thigh bone and shin bone so that we can watch uh, throughout the surgery. Map out the patient's knee to match up to the CT scan on the computer. And then this is the best and most exciting part is while there is a very expensive robot that helps us to make the cuts, the intraoperative ligament balancing and adjustments that we can make in surgery is sort of the next level uh, of thinking and how we can really optimize patient tracking and, and outcomes. So we try to get the patient's knees balanced in both flexion and extension uh, to do that. So here's kind of a, a close up that you can see. You can see we can find the correct size for each patient. Again, eight different sizes that we can do to try to find as close to fit as we can. And then we try to fit that using real-time data to make real-time adjustments uh, to optimize the position of those components during surgery. So we map out the, the knee in space with those optical trackers, sort of verifying where that leg is so that the computer can match that up to the CT scan. We verify that, so there's uh, confirmation that it's that patient's CT scan that, that we're using, uh, so we avoid any errors that way. And then this is the, the pre-resection balancing, so we can make adjustments as we try to balance these components uh, to give us a gap. So the, the numbers that you see there is 18 on the inside and outside of the knee. And that's the gap that we need for the implants that are going in place. So that's the amount of uh, space that we're creating that's going to get filled by the, the implants. So we want those to match up in both extension and inflection so that it gives the patient a stable arc of motion throughout the knee. Um, and this is really one of the, the best ways we've come to confirm that stability throughout the range of motion. Once we like where those components are positioned, uh, we can bring in the robotic arm and it allows us again to make safe, uh, accurate cuts. Uh, so we use a saw this time instead of a burr um, and we make the cuts of the distal femur to clean up the ends of the bone there. There's five different cuts that are made on the femoral side uh, to get rid of that arthritic bone. And then we cut off <coughs> the top of the femur at the angle that we want, or sorry, the top of the tibia at the angle that we want uh, to then put on that plate there and the plastic that goes in that dish. Early studies are starting to come out uh, showing the benefits of robotic arm assisted total knee replacement. This is one of the earliest ones that was done in uh, England. Uh, the mean operative time was a little bit higher in robotic surgery, although that was rapidly dropping down. Uh, but otherwise everything was in benefit to the uh, robotic arm assisted surgery. There was less blood loss during the surgery, less blood loss after the surgery. There was lower pain scores uh, the day of surgery and the day after surgery of a very significant measure. Um, and this matches up to what we see. So um, in addition, patients had uh, quicker range of motion and fewer physical therapy visits. And so we're seeing people with quicker recoveries and using less narcotics after the surgery. And so we think that's a big benefit uh, to robotics as well. In addition, other studies showing reduced inflammatory markers, uh, reduced soft tissue damage. Uh, so we really think this is heading in the right direction to show some improvement for patients and, and just be overall safer and better for them. We're trying to combine this technology with soft tissue uh, procedures that are minimally invasive. So where I trained with Tom Kuhn uh, out at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute, he was sort of the, an innovator in minimally invasive total knee replacement. And the goal, he always told me, was to provide an early and exceptional analgesia, then perform a low trauma surgery, and then get the patients up and moving for an early discharge and a rapid rehabilitation. So. Um, the idea here is we want to prevent the bad effects from the surgery, so we do this preemptive analgesia with Celebrex and a spinal anesthetic. 
try to avoid nausea by avoiding general anesthesia, doing things to calm your stomach with Pepsid. We do the spinal anesthetic, and, and we sure still are sedated throughout the case, so you don't have to listen to what we're doing. Um, and then we do an injection around the capsule uh, to help numb that area up, sort of like going to the dentist's office. Get patients up and early, working with range of motion with PT and ambulation the same day. And again, more and more patients are going home the same day. So um, it's actually easier to go home on the day of surgery because we do a regional block. And so that will actually wear off the day after surgery. Uh, so patients are pretty comfortable for the first 24 to 36 hours in most instances. <coughs> Excuse me, getting, getting over a little cold. Moving on and how we apply this in hips. Hip replacement is one of the most successful surgeries we have in modern medicine, uh, but we're always trying to make improvements to that. Sometimes that's to our benefit and sometimes that is not. Uh, and some of the ways we've noticed that is in bearing surface for hip replacements. Currently now, the, the vast majority of patients are getting ceramic on plastic for their bearing surface. Uh, it's a very low wear rate and actually has reduced risk for infection as well. This is uh, coming on the heels of where routinely things were done metal on plastic. So the ball was metal and the, there was a plastic liner. Uh, but they found there was some metal ions that could be formed between the cobalt chrome head uh, and the titanium stem. And then there was also sort of a, a push 10, 15 years ago for metal on metal replacements. Uh, but those had sort of unfortunately large failure rates uh, due to forming metal ions and, and pseudo tumors. Metal on metal is also why you won't hear me talk about uh, hip resurfacing in this talk. There are some narrow indications for hip resurfacing. Uh, Dr. Rector was great at hip resurfacing. Uh, Dr. Chen has taken over for Dr. Rector as far as doing hip resurfacing, but the indications for that have narrowed significantly. Um, and I, really a conversation to have um, with Dr. Chen at this point um, about if you're a good candidate for hip resurfacing or, or whether you should just have a hip replacement. There was a Grey's Anatomy episode a year or two ago uh, where the, one of the doctors went crazy because they had a metal on metal hip replacement. So I always like to sort of bring a little bit of uh, you know, current knowledge uh, to give examples of what I'm talking about. The way that we do the hip replacement <coughs> is very important as well. Uh, there's three different approaches. So there's a posterior approach, a lateral approach, and then an anterior, direct anterior approach. Um, I think that the direct anterior approach is superior uh, in most instances for, for uh, hip replacement surgery. This is a approach that is minimally invasive to the hip joint. Um, it allows a surgeon good access to the hip without having to detach any muscles or tendons. Uh, so it allows us to, to get excellent exposure um, and perform the surgery safely uh, without having to damage as many muscles. Traditional hip replacement can have uh, you know, a six to 12 inch incision on the side. Uh, you do have to cut into what we call the short external rotators or stabilizers of the hip. And this is why there's some restrictions after a posterior hip replacement surgery as far as leg position and an increased risk for dislocation. Doing an anterior approach surgery, uh, four or five inch incision uh, must in, by the front that allows us to spread between muscles and tendons. Why do I do it this way? Uh, Mainly from anatomy, uh, the hip is actually closer to the front of the body. The hip joint is more toward the groin than on the side of the hip. And this is a true surgical anatomy. So it's an intramuscular plane. It's an internervous plane. Uh, it allows us to spread between muscles, not detach any muscles, not cut through any muscles. Uh, minimal risk to the nerves. So I think it truly is, meets the definition of a minimally invasive surgery. I think there's less pain afterwards. I think it's a quick, quicker restoration of function, uh, shorter or no hospital stay. Again, a majority of patients are going home the same day. Uh, and all that combined probably makes it a more economical uh, approach uh, because there's chance for fewer disloca dislocations after the surgery. Um, and patients have fewer physical therapy visits after the surgery as well. It's an ideal soft tissue interval. Uh, so we're spreading between those muscles. It allows a very e uh, simple way for the patient to be positioned. Uh, so patients are just flat on their back on a table um, and allows excellent exposure of the socket or cup side of the surgery. And yes, you are strapped into that contraption on the right-hand side of the screen during a hip replacement surgery, but it allows us to maneuver your leg in space um, while you sleep through the procedure. Why doesn't everyone do it this way? Uh, it can be unfamiliar territory. Uh, luckily, I learned this during my fellowship 
11 years ago now, um, and have done it ever since. Uh, but it is difficult to learn. The exposure of the thigh bone or femur can be somewhat difficult. Um, and it does require a little bit of specialized equipment. Show you a little bit about how it's done. So we use special instruments and retractors um, to get in and get access to the joint. We have a special helmet that has a light that shines into the, into the hole. And you can see on the right-hand side, us actually looking into the hip joint um, and getting things positioned and organized. Um, and you can see how that table maneuvers your leg in space. Uh, it basically acts as an extra assistant uh, that doesn't get tired or need bathroom breaks. Um, show a little bit about how this looks on the screen. Well, that worked when we were doing our trials. So, uh, not sure what happened to our video here, but as you can see, we're spreading between muscles. Um, we actually go in and, and cut that bone off at the to cut that ball out um, and remove that bone. Uh, we get excellent exposure of the cup, and so we prep and position that, freshen up the bone in there, and put it in our metal cup. Um, maneuver the the thigh bone in space to get access to that, and put in our our trial. Once we have our trials in place, we're able to maneuver that back and reduce that hip joint um, into position. Typical precautions uh, for traditional hip replacement, um, they don't want you to cross your legs or, or sit with your leg bent up more than a right angle or 90 degrees. They want you to point your toes inward and often you're found sleeping with a pillow between your legs and having to lie on your back while you sleep. With an anterior approach, really just don't want you to swing your leg all the way out behind you and kind of rotate it around. Um, other than that, there's very few restrictions. Um, and so definitely less risk for dislocation and less concerns for patients. They can sleep out in a way that's comfortable for them um, and they don't have to worry about tying their own shoes or, or things like that. So more benefits, you know, the decreased hospital stay or even avoiding a hospital uh, completely, uh, quicker rehabilitation. A smaller incision, less muscle disruption, um, quicker recovery time and, and less scarring, potential for less blood loss and less time in the surgery, as well as reduced post-operative pain. And then the risk of that ball popping out of the cup or dislocation is reduced by going from an anterior approach uh, as opposed to a posterior approach. I think this approach is better for patients. I think they have a quicker recovery. Uh, they have minimal, if any, hip precautions, so patients get back to, to almost everything in their yoga repertoire, except for Warrior Two. just cheat your foot forward um, if you do Warrior Two, And really, as long as you don't push too hard, it's very unlikely that you can make that hip dislocate um, because of the excellent control we get over our component position. So what we, now we want to sort of do what we did with knees and combine our soft tissue friendly procedure with enhanced technology. And so about 10 years ago, they brought robotic arm assistance into hip replacement. And the idea with this and for computer navigation, hip replacement is really increasing our level of precision and having confidence in our component positions uh, because the recovery room is a little bit too late to make changes uh, after we get our post-operative x-ray. Um, and the whole goal of this is to try to optimize surgical results to give patients the best outcome that we can. When we're doing this with manual total hip replacements on the left, it's a plain x-ray. So we're taking a three-dimensional object and turning it into a two-dimensional picture and trying to make uh, plans and adjustments that way. When we use robotics, again, we get that CT scan model, uh, that three-dimensional model. We can really fine-tune and place the components exactly where they need to fit for each individual patient and actually see the results of our surgery before we start our surgery. And that's kind of the best part. There was a big study uh, that was done at Massachusetts General Hospital about 10 years ago. It's a big, huge center of excellence for hip replacement. And they found that they were about 50-50 as far as getting all their components uh, in what we call the safe zone or target zone for hip replacement. So uh, some of them were way outside. Some of them were, were inside the, the joint, but it was very uh, difficult uh, and sort of humbling for us to look at our results that way and, and to see that a center of excellence would sort of be at a, a coin flip level of accuracy. 
Um, with the robot, uh, they compared that in 96% uh, within the target zone and 95% within four degrees of the plan. And really the ones that they planned outside of the target zone or that were outside of the target zone were planned that way. So they actually increased uh, relative to what they found on the CT scans uh, to optimize it for each individual patient. So very accurate, very reproducible system that allows us to be much more accurate uh, in executing our surgery. This was a study done by Dr. Dome, who was uh, Dr. Chen's mentor in Chicago. His whole point was to try to prove that he didn't need to have a robot. Um, and he found that he was pretty good. He was 80% inside this safe zone, but the robot like, arm assistance was 100%. So the robot was definitely better uh, than he was uh, in, in executing the surgery in a more consistent fashion. What does this all do? What's our main goal with the hip replacement? Is to, for pain relief. That's what, if a hip doesn't hurt, if a knee doesn't hurt, we can't really make it better. Uh, but if it's hurting and causing pain and discomfort, we wanna eliminate that so you can get back um, and restore your function and lifestyle. Optimize patient outcomes in the most economic fashion that we can. Uh, so we want to not rack up the, the cost of these, and so we wanna make sure this is all cost effective. Using similar ideas to the knee, so uh, low trauma surgery, avoiding the complications with analgesia, uh, avoiding pain after the surgery, uh, same protocol. Uh, we do that sedation and the, the capsular injection and take an arthritic hip uh, and replace it in a very accurate manner. Uh, and again, these patients are up and moving, walking the same day uh, and hopefully able to go home the same day. This was uh, my first patient uh, in Boulder. So this was uh, 10 years ago almost now. Uh, actually fell skiing and broke his hip and we replaced his hip. He was in his early 80s at this point and he did 10,000 miles on his bike in the first 18 months after his hip replacement. He was cresting Teton Pass a little over four months after his surgery. Uh, and actually a little about three and a half months after his surgery. Uh, and then did a century ride about four and a half months after his surgery. I um, actually recently saw him in clinic uh, 10 years out and he's in his 90s now. And he told me he had 56,000 miles on this hip replacement. So he's put good use and really tried to, to prove that these are durable implants. In summary, uh, robotic hip replacement is more accurate than manual hip replacement. Multiple studies have shown this. Uh, clinical accuracy is improved with lower dislocation rate, less leg length discrepancy, less blood loss, and better patient reported outcome scores. Um, than using robotics than versus manual total hip. Uh, while the robotic total hip did take a little bit more time initially, um, there was no uh, infection increase that occurred with that. Um, and so the cost benefit analysis requires a little further study, uh, but it is trending in favor of uh, robotics over manual. There are many risks of surgery that we talk about. So they're no, including but not limited to bleeding, infection, damage to nerves and vessels, risk of blood clots, blood clots going to your lungs. Uh, rare things like stroke, heart attack, and death. So we understand these are not uh, minimal procedures that we're undergoing, uh, but we try to do the best that we can to give you as good outcome as we can across the board, no matter who's doing your surgery, whether it's me, one of my partners at Boulder, uh, Center for Orthopedics, or any of the other uh, providers in the county. Um, everybody's just trying to do the best they can for you. COVID protocols, um, luckily we're getting to the point where I get to stop talking about this very soon. Uh, we've been doing elective surgery since April, 2020. Um, we no longer actually have to get COVID tests, but all staff still does follow the proper PPE, the personal protective equipment protocols. Um, and we seem to be finally moving uh, through this pandemic episode um, and the, the backlog and, and patients getting their surgery is, is quite remarkable. Um, as we're busier now uh, in the spring when we're usually pretty slow uh, than we are some years at the end of the year when we're usually very busy. So thank you for taking your time um, with me tonight. I hope that you gained some knowledge um, and enjoyed the time we spent together. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Blackwood. Um, we've had a little bit of a technical glitch here. We want our audience to know that you can refresh your screen and there's a link and click on that and that will link you to the lecture as well as the chat box where you can now ask your questions. Uh, we have the other questions that you have been asking captured. And so while you guys um, catch up with us here, we're going to start 
with the questions that we already have. Fire away. All right. So, doctor, can you re remind us, please, approximately how long does a replaced hip last? That's a good question. So, uh, we think there's a 90% chance that a replaced hip or knee lasts for 20 years. We think there's a good chance it lasts for 30. Uh, labs would tell us that it lasts for significantly longer than that, uh, but we're looking at real people and real outcomes. Um, they do have significantly lower rare weights than they used to, and so I think that 20 to 30 year range is very realistic. All right. What do you think of advanced regenerative shots? What do I think of advanced regenerative shots? Uh, I think that there is some potential in some of the advanced regenerative shots such as stem cells or PRP in certain areas. Um, I do not think there has been proven performance in joints uh, to justify the cost associated with those. Um, and so at this point, and also it's a bit of a misnomer to call it regenerative. There is zero evidence anywhere showing that these joints regenerate and that it cures your arthritis. It may help with pain for a short period of time, maybe, uh, but it is not going to prevent you from needing your joint replaced if you need your joint replaced. Uh, there are people who say they get great results. You don't know what their x-rays look like. Maybe they didn't have that bad of arthritis. Um, but if you have severe bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, those regenerative advanced shots, not advanced shots, um, are very unlikely to give you uh, much long-term relief. All right, thank you. This is a little bit of a long one. Does having plates and pins from a previous surgery for a broken neck of the femur reduce the chances of a successful hip replacement surgery? And why wouldn't they have replaced the total hip in the first place? Uh, that's a good multi-part question. So um, if you have a previous surgery with hardware in place, um, we still do hip replacements in that instance. Um, it does make them a little more complex, but um, usually not something that we can't deal with. Um, there is discussion about whether these fractures of the proximal femur or hip fractures as they're called should be treated with hip replacement or whether they should be treated with half hip replacement or whether they should be fixed. Um, and so it kind of depends on uh, what kind of fracture it was, where it was broken. Sometimes it's very reasonable to just go ahead and um, fix it and it will heal on its own and you hopefully never need another surgery. Uh, but sometimes if they fix it and it, it looks like it should heal perfectly well, um, you know, biology takes over and it just doesn't work out. And so sometimes there's failures with that. Um, that doesn't mean that they should have done a hip replacement to begin with. Um, they may have been doing exactly what you needed, but the bone didn't heal the way it was supposed to. Um, and so that's a very good question of why didn't we do this? Um, because not everybody needs a hip replacement after this. Um, some people heal just well, just as well getting it fixed. Okay. What is the price, the cost of a total hip replacement? That is a good question. What is the cost? So I did mention cost with the other injections, so it's only fair I mention cost for our stuff. Um, Medicare costs uh, for these are somewhere in the, you know, for my portion, of overall cost of care is probably somewhere in the twelve dollars to $13,000 range that's covered by Medicare, uh, 80%. My portion of that's about 10%. Uh, if, you know, private insurances, it's maybe twenty-five to 30000 uh, depending on the, the facility that you're going to. Um, it's less expensive at surgery centers than, than at hospitals. Um, and then for cash pay, it um, depends on how you negotiate with uh, the institutions. Uh, but a lot of them, especially Boulder Community, has a new uh, cash pay program that makes it less daunting. Um, you will get bills that say that it's seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. No one pays that for a joint replacement. So um, definitely talk with your surgeon, talk with your hospital, your surgery center um, if you don't have insurance. Um, and if you do have insurance, um, usually it's, this is definitely covered by those insurances. It will eat up your deductible, um, but uh, that then sort of gives you free care for the rest of the year. Um, 
once your deductible has been hit. Okay. Thank you for that. Do you have any advice or know of studies on turmeric for reducing or delaying joint pain or replacement? Uh, so there are a lot of things that are outside of my realm of expertise. So um, there are a lot of pushes, in, and especially here in Boulder, not to, not to use a stereotype of Boulder, but there's a lot of natural medicine ideas. Uh, turmeric has some anti-inflammatory properties, um, but I'm not aware of any big studies showing that it's um, prevents arthritis. It may help with some of the inflammation from arthritis um, and can help with sort of general inflammation. I know that that is a, a real proven thing. Um, but once the arthritis starts, there's very little that, that stops it necessarily. Okay. Is there an age limitation on either the knee or the hip surgeries? Uh, is there an age limitation for any of these surgeries? So the vast majority of patients that have these done are 67, 68 years old, plus or minus. Um, that's the most, that's the average age. Um, we've had patients who are teenagers get their hip replaced. We've had people who are over 100 get their hip replaced. Um, as long as you are healthy enough uh, to have the surgery, we don't have an age limit on the upper end. Um, we try to prevent people from, that are on the younger side from needing to have these surgeries, um, but there are many reasons why those joints can wear out prematurely, um, and it's not you know, worth making them suffer until they get to age 50 or 60 uh, to have those joints replaced. So there's not really a cutoff either way as far as old or young. Um, we just try to be smart about who's a good surgical candidate um, and the pros and cons and risks associated uh, because they're different in both age groups. Okay. How much time should there be between cortisone shots? How much time should there be between cortisone shots? So uh, that's a good question. Uh, what I use is four months in between uh, cortisone shots for the knees. Um, I think you know sometimes if it's severe, if patients aren't able to have surgery, that potentially three months is, is okay. Uh, but I think if you can stretch it out to four months, that's better. All right. What is the range of motion with a total hip replacement post-surgery with PT for an active and motivated person? Take your time. Sorry, I finally saw there was a water I could get. Um, what's the range of motion for a hip replacement afterwards? Yes, especially um, with PT when this person is active and motivated. So uh, for hip replacement afterwards, um, we're looking for improvements from where you started. So uh, most people have restricted range of motion that's pretty severe afterwards. And by the time we do the surgery and release the capsule and, and sort of get that going, they have great range of motion almost immediately after the surgery. Some people need to work on it with motivation and exercises and physical therapy. And somebody's gonna think this is a cop-out answer, but Really, you should be getting close to the other side or close, you know, better than what you were prior to surgery and close to what the normal hip is, but it probably won't ever be exactly like the normal hip, if that makes sense. Okay. There's no numbers that we go through for hip replacements. In knee replacements, we look for numbers, but in hips, we don't. Okay. Um, I want to circle back to the price uh, question for a second. This person has Kaiser and um, they were wondering if they could still have a consultation with you since usually they have to go to Kaiser to have the procedure done. Uh, yeah, so we have um, patients that will come and, and do cash pay for the out of Kaiser. Um, we have people who will switch their insurances uh, for a year out of Kaiser to, to come and have surgery. Um, and so that's, that's definitely an option. Uh, we have cash pay pricing for that. Um, to be honest, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but if you called the office, um, they could let you know what uh, consultation would be. If you can get your studies from Kaiser, that way we don't have to repeat those and that will save you some money as well. Um, but that'd probably be the, the easiest way to do it. Okay. After having one partial replacement, is it possible that you will need another for the other side of the knee later on? That's a good question. So if you have one part of the knee replaced, does that mean in the future you're gonna have a second partial knee? Um, 
and in general, the idea is no. So there's, a, again, a 90% chance uh, that you'll get 15 to 20 years out of a partial knee uh, without having to do anything to the rest of the joint. Um, and then it becomes a question um, of how the joint's wearing out if, if the other joints decide to wear out as to what the best treatment would be. If the whole knee is starting to wear out, it's probably best just to go ahead and, and transition that to a total knee from a partial knee. Um, if the rest of the knee is doing okay, but there's just isolated disease on the outside of the knee or under the kneecap, you could go in and just replace in those areas. Uh, that is an option, uh, but it's definitely very patient specific and, and not um, a default answer. Okay. So this person wants to know if taking Celebrex prior to surgery is essential, and what if they can't tolerate that? Uh, the Celebrex is not essential, so there are limitations as far as what we can give you around the time of surgery due to risk for bleeding. Um, so in order to help prevent blood clots, we usually put people on aspirin after the surgery. Uh, sometimes we have to put them on a stronger blood thinner. Um, and there are people who can't tolerate Celebrex or who can't take Celebrex, um, and so they just don't take that. We use Celebrex around the time of surgery because it affects bleeding less than Advil or Aleve or those type of medicines, uh, but it's not essential. There are definitely people that don't take it around the time. Okay. Can you explain again the differences and benefits of anterior versus posterior hip replacements? Yeah, so um, I think the biggest benefit for an anterior approach as opposed to a posterior approach is with an anterior approach, we're able to spread between muscles and not cut any of them. When they do a posterior approach, whether it's a more traditional posterior approach or what they're calling direct superior, you have to cut through muscle to get there. Um, and so uh, we don't have to do that from an anterior approach. Uh, and so that's the biggest difference. When you cut through those muscles, especially in a more traditional posterior lateral approach, uh, you have to open up the capsule and take down those muscles that stabilize the hip joint. And that increases your risk for dislocation after the surgery. Um, and that doesn't happen in an anterior approach hip. And so the hip is more stable after surgery and reduces your risk for dislocation. And there's pretty strong evidence that the recovery for the first six to 12 weeks after surgery is easier and better with an anterior approach as opposed to a posterior approach. But if you have a well done posterior approach hip, the patients can still do very well long term and you can have a great outcome. Uh, is there one that you recommend? Uh, I recommend an anterior approach hip in almost every patient. There are sometimes patients uh, whose body morphology is not amenable to uh, proceeding with an anterior approach total hip. Um, if they have a, a sort of a big panis or, or sort of uh, redundant skin that hangs over the thigh, uh, that can cause a fold in the area where we make the incision um, and it increases the risk for infection. Um, and so in those cases, I would actually recommend a posterior approach uh, because I think it's safer and reduces that risk. Okay. Do you think future robotic technology will mean less real-time involvement in the procedure by the surgeon? That's a good question. So I often get asked if I'm just sort of hanging out, having a coffee while the robot does the surgery. Uh, I find it highly unlikely that there'll be sort of autonomous robots that will just follow our instructions um, and do the surgery on their own. Um, I think that there will be surgeons involved directly. Um, there are other robotic systems out there uh, for soft tissue like a da Vinci and those things where there is a little bit of space between the surgeon and the, the robot that they're using. Uh, but in orthopedics, for all the robotic systems that are out there, it's very hands-on with the robot, um, which I think makes it more comfortable for the patient, more comfortable for the surgeon, and I think safer for both parties involved. Okay. How do you tell whether knee or hip operation is needed if you have arthritis and pain in both knee and hip? That's a good question. So uh, we do have a subset of patients uh, of mine that have had all four joints replaced. Uh, so it is possible to have both hips and knees uh, bothering you at the same time. Uh, we start with x-rays, so there is a nerve that runs by the hip that goes down to the knee, and so sometimes I'll have patients who have knee pain, but it's really coming from the arthritis in their hip, and when their hip is replaced, the knee pain goes away. Um, I've had some people who've had 
knees and hips were placed on the same side. Uh, in general, if they're, all things are equal and they're both arthritic, the hip and the knee, usually you start with replacing the hip and then replace the knee. Um, but if the knee is causing much more pain and discomfort than the hip, then you know, it's okay to replace the knee first and then replace the hip. Uh, but really, physical exam, x-rays, uh, just talking to the patients and figuring out which is causing more pain and discomfort helps us differentiate which is uh, the issue and the bigger issue at that point. So if you just do one first, how far apart uh, do you, are you able to get the second type of surgery? It's a good question. So it depends on uh, how old patients are, how healthy they are. Um, there are people who can have surgery six weeks apart. Um, some people it's better to wait eight to 12 weeks apart, uh, but you can definitely have them within a short period of time in between. Okay, that's good to know. Do you recommend physical therapy after hip replacement? Some say you don't need it after a hip surgery replacement, that just plain old walking is the therapy. It sounds like that person's been in my clinic before. Um, <laughs> we don't routinely give physical therapy after hip replacement surgery. I actually want patients to kind of slow down and just heal for that first three to six weeks. Um, and then walk is, is probably the best exercise. We do give you exercises to do. Uh, they are fairly rudimentary and so they may not be very exciting, but really the best exercise is just to get out and walk. If in that three to six week window, um, you decide you wanna do some physical therapy, then we're definitely fine with setting you up for therapy. But the majority of patients don't need any formal physical therapy after a hip replacement. Can, you know, comparison that to the knees, all of our knee replacements, we send to physical therapy. Okay. We want to remind our audience that we are taking questions. And if you have switched over to StreamSpot, uh, you can ask them there or even at the, uh, uh, the Boulder website, the bch.org website. This person says, my second shot of hyaluronic acid intensified my knee pain significantly for over a month. Do you know what might have gone wrong? Uh, so that can happen. Sometimes uh, after a, an injection into the knee, it can actually make it worse. It's, very, it's fairly rare that that happens. Um, it could be that the body just responded to the second injection differently than the first time. Um, there is also a chance that the injection didn't end up in the joint and sort of was around the perijoint tissues. Um, it's hard to say exactly. Um, none of us are perfect even if we use ultrasound or fluoroscopy uh, to try to, be, try to be as accurate as we can. But um, in general, those would be my guesses for what may have occurred. Okay. I have been tested for and found to have uh, the HLA-B27 gene for arthritis. Does this change treatment for knee, hip, and back pain? Well, that's a good question. So, you know, the HLA B27 is usually associated with some of those more inflammatory arthritis. Um, and so that may benefit from talking with the rheumatologist and sort of seeing what those treatment options are. Uh, they can come up with some medications. Uh, if those medications don't work or there are not treatments um, associated uh, with that associated finding, um, then, you know, we still do hip and knee replacements in those patients uh, and they have very good outcomes. Okay. Just one second, please. Just one second. And again, want to remind our audience that if you have questions, uh, please ask them and we will get to as many as we can here tonight. So this person has had both hips replaced. Is it still possible for them to break their hip? What happens? Do these replacements ever break? Uh, that's a good question. So it's incredibly rare for the metal to break, although it can happen. Uh, it usually would be you know, metal fatigue in sort of a very rare situation. Um, so that, that is a possibility, it's very rare. Uh, usually what happens uh, in that instance where you've already had a hip replacement, if there's a fall or something that would cause something similar to a hip fracture, 
Um, you can still break the bone around the implants, um, and that's called a periprosthetic fracture. Uh, and those are sort of difficult to piece back together and, and do revision surgeries on. Uh, but that would be more common than the implant itself breaking. All right. How do you determine if elevated levels of cobalt and chromium, chromium warrant revision of a previous metal on metal hip, hip surgery? That's a good question. So uh, we sort of follow those levels serially. Um, so about every year or so, get a, a level. Um, if they start to increase or elevate, um, then that may be a sign that there's some metallosis forming um, and that they maybe need to have a revision surgery done. Uh, if they are initially just sort of very shockingly high, then that's definitely a good sign that they need to, to be revised and replaced. Um, they will be higher than normal, but there's usually on there a level that's for with and without a metal on metal hip replacement. And so there is an allowance for a slightly elevated level that's not concerning. All right. So um, you mentioned this. I think we still want to have a little discussion about this. Um, that you had said that sometimes it's better to get full or partial knee replacement sooner rather than later. But then you also mentioned that it was sometimes you could do it too soon or too young. Um, can you have a little bit more discussion on that, please? Sure. So, I mean, the, the idea with the timing of the joint replacement is you don't want um, to kind of be totally fine and wake up one day and your joint hurts and then you don't really do anything or take any anti-inflammatories or, or do any exercises or have any injections and sort of go straight to a joint replacement. And there's sort of a process that, that we go through to sort of help you to, to nurse the, the arthritic joint along to sort of help delay you needing to have a joint replacement because these are man-made devices and they can wear out. Uh, as we talked about, you know, 20 to 30 years is great, but if you're 40, you know, that's not the rest of your life. Um, if you're 60, it probably is the rest of your life. Uh, and so we're trying to prevent that second surgery down the road. That being said, if you're 40 and you've had scopes and had injections and taken medications and it's really impacting your life, you don't have to wait until you're 50 to have the surgery just because you're 40. Um, and same way that if you're 70, you don't have to have it replaced just because you're 70. Um, you know, there are a lot of things you can do to help treat the pain from the arthritic joints without jumping straight to surgery. And conversely to that, you don't have to suffer with arthritis just because you're on the young side of things. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, we talked about a, a knee and a hip uh, and how you might stagger those surgeries. What about if you have just both your knees uh, that need to be fixed? Um, should you do them together, different times, how long of a wait in between? Uh, so in general, I recommend not doing them at the same time. Um, I find that, that the risks that we talked about on the, the risk sheet of the surgeries um, is instead of one plus one is two, is more like one plus one is five. So there's a slightly elevated risk uh, having those surgeries at the same time. In addition, you only get pain meds as if you had one knee and you have two. So um, they can be, you know, it's obviously a more painful experience to go through. Um, there are people that say, oh, I would never get my knees replaced again. I'm glad I got them both done at the same time. I'd never do that again because it was a horrible experience. And it was because they got them both done at the same time, not because they got a knee replaced. Uh, and so if you stagger them and stage them and do, again, six weeks apart in many cases is fine, whether it's six weeks, six months, or six years is up to the patient. Um, and then in patients who maybe need a little bit more time or a little bit older, you know, three months in between is, is pretty reasonable as well to kind of recover from the first surgery and then have the second surgery. Okay. So can you walk us through the typical range of motion after knee replacement, please? Sure. So for, for range of motion after the knee replacement, our initial goal is not actually bending, but getting the leg flat. So we make sure at the time of surgery that you can bend the knee and get it flat. But after surgery, you know, your body sometimes doesn't like that. 
especially if there's been a contracture or you had a lack of extension in your knee beforehand, which is very common. Um, and so the first initial goal is to get the leg flat straight. And then over the first three weeks, our goal is to get close to 90 degrees of flexion. Uh, by the time you get to six weeks, you should be past 105 degrees of flexion. <coughs> and again, most people are, are well beyond that at this point, but that's sort of our baseline that we're looking for. And then by the time you're full recovery, 12 weeks to a year out from surgery, we're hoping to get, you know, an average is 120, 125 as far as the degrees of motion and flexion. Some people get more than that, some people get less than that. It often depends on where you start. So if you start at 100 degrees, you're not going to get 140 degrees. Uh, but if you start at 130 degrees, you should get close to 130 degrees. Uh, so that's, there's some limits with the soft tissue and your starting point. But that's sort of the stepwise progression we're looking for is actually getting the leg flat first, then 90, 105, and hoping to get to 120, 125. Plus, if patients want to, they can keep working on that. Okay. What percentage of surgeries are unsuccessful in eliminating the pain? That's a good question. So uh, obviously none of us are perfect as we do these surgeries. Um, we try to make sure the indications for the surgery uh, are the correct ones. So uh, if patients don't have a lot of arthritis in the, the joint but have a lot of pain, uh, sometimes the pain can be not coming from that joint. <coughs> so we have more success when there's more radiographic evidence supporting the need for replacement. And sometimes the, the body just doesn't respond uh, after the surgery. And so, you know, I showed that earlier graphic about 80 to 85% overall satisfaction rate. I think that locally here, um, looking at it, I'd say mine's higher in the 90%, but that's not perfect. There are still people who are unhappy after their joint replacement. Um, if you go online, you can find them because they have nothing else to do but get mad at the surgeon who did their surgery. Uh, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to make patients as good as they can be. Um, and it's rare, but some causes of that can, you know, there's some people that we don't know that are maybe allergic to the implants. Uh, sometimes in spite of all of our best efforts, this isn't replacing a tire on a car where nothing changes around the tire. We can do an excellent surgery at the time of surgery, but knees or hips can stiffen up after surgery, they can loosen up after surgery, and that can cause either stiffness or instability. Um, there can be instances where the cement fails if we try to cement the components in place. There can be instances where if we have the bone grow onto the implant as it's designed, sometimes it doesn't grow onto the implant. Um, so there's many factors that can go into to why a surgery could be unsuccessful um, in spite of it being done as well as the, the surgeon could. Okay. Thank you. So this person's mother had two knee replacements. One had to be done again. Does this happen now with the advanced robotic surgeries? Uh, so this happens less with the advanced robotics. And like I just got done saying, even with as much technology as we use, we're still not perfect. We want to be. Um, but, you know, the there is biology involved in some of this stuff. And so uh, it depends on why that surgery needed to be done again. Uh, but I would say in general, it is less common that there are revisions after uh, robotic assisted surgeries. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if we've had this question, I'll ask it to you. Um, does occasional Celebrex reduce pain or is taking it daily important or necessary? Uh, so in general, taking anti-inflammatories uh, can be helpful in reducing some of the pain and inflammation. Uh, some people respond differently to different medications. The studies that actually put Celebrex on the market showed that it was no better than just a Aleve. So if you don't have concerns about bleeding and can tolerate Aleve, it's actually just as strong as Celebrex. Um, there are other more potent anti-inflammatories that you'd want to take for shorter periods of time. Uh, but in general, if you're... Uh, taking an anti-inflammatory on a consistent basis, you want to take as low a dose as you need for as short a period of time as you can. And so if you have to take a daily dose, you want to take something that's fairly low dose to do that. And maybe take an occasional break for a week or two to sort of let your system recover a little bit. Okay. This person said that they just began Evenity injections for bone density. 
Would this treatment reduce the need for hip replacement? Uh, so these um, bone density treatments, so that's treating osteoporosis or helping to slow osteoporosis and helping to improve the quality of the bone. It doesn't do anything for cartilage or joints as far as improving the, the cartilage or the quality of joints. So um, they are independent of each other. So hopefully you don't have arthritis in the joints. Um, and so the, the strengthening of the bone is just helpful in general to help prevent you from having fractures or, or from falls or anything like that. Okay. Um, so back to hip and knee replacement. Uh, what is the typical pain management? So our typical process and multimodal pain for the patients that are having their joints replaced, um, we preoperatively give them uh, a muscle relaxant, uh, Celebrex, the Tylenol, do the spinal anesthetic. Um, they actually do a regional block uh, in knee replacements after the surgery. We do injections around the joint in both hip and knee replacements. And then after the surgery, we have patients on Tylenol, uh, max dose um, for multiple days after the surgery. If they're able to tolerate it, we put them on Celebrex after the surgery. Uh, routinely, the aspirin uh, for helping to prevent blood clots, um, although sometimes we have to use stronger medication for that. Uh, and then for breakthrough pain, our routine is uh, oxycodone uh, as a narcotic to help with the pain. And we give sort of small doses or uh, prescriptions for that uh, to help reduce the risk for uh, developing dependency on those medications. Okay, good to know. What are the typical symptoms of a worn out joint replacement 20 to 30 years down the road? Pain, instability of the joint? Uh, yeah, so if you've had your joint replaced 20, 30 years ago uh, or in, in 20 or 30 years after it's replaced. Uh, if you're not having problems, then the joint replacement probably is not either. Uh, but sometimes you can have some symptoms of instability or some pain um, associated with that joint. Um, that's why we try to have sort of routine maintenance or sort of check-ins with our patients. Uh, usually have patients come in at two years after surgery and then every five years after that uh, to kind of get serial x-rays to pay attention and see if joints are wearing out. Um, oftentimes, patients are busy and doing well and don't do that, which is okay. Um, but that's sort of why we have those routine visits set up is so we can see this. If you've had something in for 20 or 30 years, it's probably worth getting periodic x-rays uh, because it could wear out. Um, they definitely used a lot of different materials 20 or 30 years ago um, compared to what we use now. Okay. If someone has significant bilateral lower leg foot neuropathy, would that affect the decision to replace a knee? Uh, if patients have other sort of neuropathy factors that can impact the recovery after surgery, um, and so it'd be a discussion of you know, how much they're able to get around and, and move. Um, patients need to be able to participate in the therapy afterwards. Um, so uh, sometimes we have them try the therapy beforehand to see if they can build up some strength and, and participate in it that way. Um, but there's no direct contraindication for surgery based on the neuropathy. Okay. These next two are fairly specific. This person had ACL reconstruction using the patella tendon 35 years ago. It's held up well, but this person has been told a total knee replacement is in their future. They can't squat uh, down on their knee because of limited range of motion. Will range of motion increase with the replacement? That's a good question. So that sort of goes back to where we talked about knee range of motion. Uh, depends on what's going on. If there's bony reasons, so there's sometimes bone spurs or osteophytes that grow and block motion. And so if we clean those out, that can help improve the motion. Um, recently, we had actually a patient whose range of motion pre-op was from 20 to 80. Um, and she came in at three weeks with her range of motion at 100 degrees and, and zero and flat. So if we clean out all the things that are blocking it mechanically, that can dramatically increase the range of motion. Uh, but if there's not 
a bony reason that there's reduced range of motion, uh, then it's often soft tissue, and that's a harder thing to improve. And so the range of motion after surgery may not be dramatically better than it was before surgery. Okay. It might, but it may not. And then you would have discussion with the patient to see how to go forward then? Exactly. Okay. Um, this next question is also a little specific. They said that they have knee osteoarthritis due to two cartilage tears 30 years ago. They've been managing that with the chicken shots. They've noticed worsening range of motion in that particular knee. Can physical therapy help? That's a good question. So, you know, if your pain is being controlled with the hyaluronic acid injections, the chicken shots, um, and you want to try some therapy to work on motion, I think that's very reasonable. Uh, I think that could be something that could help. So therapy is good for helping with range of motion and strengthening. Uh, it's not going to cure the arthritis. It's not going to make it go away. But it can, if you're able to tolerate the pain, uh, it can make you more functional afterwards. Okay. Um, this person had hip surgery and the results were his legs were different lengths. Why does this happen? How do you avoid this? That is a good question. So that is a very common, uh, not very common, but that is a complaint after hip replacement is that the length of your legs can change. Um, the most common reason that they lengthen the operative leg um, is twofold. One is that we actually go in and cut out the labrum around the hip joint when we're doing the replacement, and the labrum acts a little bit like a suction device that keeps the hip joint stable. Um, and so when we remove that and put in artificial parts, uh, the stability of the joint isn't necessarily the same. Um, and if you've done, it's more common in a posterior approach uh, that they have to lengthen the hip to make it stable so it doesn't dislocate. Because goal number one is to replace the hip and get rid of the pain. Goal number two is to make sure it's stable and doesn't dislocate. And then goal three is to try to match up the leg lengths as close as we can. Um, I think it happens less in an anterior approach, uh, but it's not zero. And sometimes we purposely try to lengthen the leg, uh, but we can't really shorten the leg on the operative side. Uh, and sometimes there are just limitations based on the angles of the femoral neck uh, and your own body's morphology compared to what we have available uh, for implants. Um, and so there's multiple reasons that the leg lengths can be different after surgery. I tell every patient that with their having a hip replacement, there's a risk of dislocation. Uh, there's a risk of fracture anytime that we do surgery on the bone. Uh, and then there's a risk of leg lengths being different. So we try to match it up as close as we can, usually within millimeters, but we may not be perfect. Um, and so patients are aware of that before the surgery. Is it remediated with shoes? Uh, so the most common thing, if it is symptomatic leg length discrepancy, and I'll often tell patients that my left arm is an inch and a half longer than my right arm, and I didn't know that till six years ago when I finally started wearing suits, and then somebody actually measured my arms. So obviously I don't walk on my hands, um, but you can become accommodated to leg length discrepancies of a fairly significant amount and not really notice them. Um, and sometimes you have a leg length change from the operative leg being shorter initially and it gets matched up perfectly but it feels like it's longer or an apparent leg length change. Um, if you have a real leg length discrepancy and it's symptomatic, then the treatment is usually either heel wedges that you put inside the shoe or sometimes if it's bad enough they have to actually make special shoes to sort of balance that out on the other side. Okay. Um... Should I exhaust all non-surgical options before considering replacement, or does an MRI tell all? That's a good question. So um, I usually find actually x-rays to be more useful than MRIs. Uh, sometimes MRIs can make things sound much worse than they are uh, because there's a lot of stuff that shows up on there. Um, sometimes if you have normal x-rays and significant pain, then we go ahead and get an MRI to kind of see what's going on. Um, but usually it's a, in a combination of how bad the x-rays are, how bad the MRI is, what you've already tried, um, and what the physical exam shows. So, you know, you don't have to try all the injections if it's not going to work. So if the x-rays are bad enough, the MRI is bad enough, um, then you try reasonable options. But there are sometimes patients will come in and 
there aren't reasonable options. The arthritis is so severe that really their only option is to get it replaced. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our audience tonight? Uh, just thank you for spending your evening with me. Uh, I hope that you had some answers to your questions and, and learned some information. Um, and that we're at uh, the Boulder Center for Orthopedics uh, here on Pearl Street uh, in Boulder. Um, and we're actually expanding uh, Boulder Center for Orthopedics out toward I-25 in Broomfield uh, at, a, at a new facility out there uh, starting at the end of the year, first part of, of next year. So. Um, yeah, we're just trying to, to do the best that we can for patients and, and expanding our footprint to do so. Thank you. We want to uh, apologize to our audience for some technical difficulties, but also uh, remind you that in a couple of days you'll receive an email link uh, that will give you uh, information from tonight's lecture. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. In the next couple of days, again, you'll receive a post-lecture survey by email as well. Please take a minute to fill this out and thank you for joining us and have a good night.